from WXOJLP Northampton, 103.3 FM, your Valley Free Radio Station. Welcome. I'm Warren Odess Gillette, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. Welcome to A Baha'i Perspective. I recorded an interview with Joan Lincoln on March 18, 2017. Joni is a classically trained musician and was attending Mills College when she was introduced to the Baha'i faith. After becoming a Baha'i, she aspired to travel about the world promoting the teachings of the Baha'i faith. She explains how she had to transfer her music abilities to more informal genres like singer, songwriter, and jazz as she was living abroad. We play her music that she had written during her lifetime traveling for the Baha'i faith. I started the interview by asking Joni where she grew up and what was it like growing up there. I grew up mostly in the New England area, particularly in the summers when we would always come back to a town south of Boston. It was a very calm upbringing with a certain amount of, I would say, slightly privileged approach to life. I had a lot of sports and music and activities and good schooling and all those kinds of things. What was religious life like growing up? Actually, there was really very little religious life. Our family was part of the Episcopalian Church and used to go to church mostly on sort of Christmas and Easter. It just was not a a strong factor at all, so I sort of grew up without very strong religious background. And was music central to your growing up? Music was really always there. My mom played the violin, and my auntie played the piano. My other auntie played the flute. My grandmother played the piano. Everybody played music. All my cousins played music. And so there was quite a bit of music that was there right from the beginning, always playing some kind of music in the in the home, classical music or show tunes or, you know, all those things in the sort of early 50s. And that was definitely present. But then you ended up studying music when you went off to college? Yes, that was what I wished to major in. So I went from Boston to Mills College in Oakland, California. And there I was able to major in music which was actually very satisfying because it was a a small school and not very many music majors. So our classes were small and we had very good professors. So I'm very thankful for that experience. How did you eventually run into the Baha'i faith? Well, that was all tied in with my musical education at Mills because practically the first class I had, you know, they had those basic harmony classes and all of that. I ended up sitting next to a girl who introduced herself to me. And then very rapidly, I discovered that she was a Baha'i. She played the flute. I played the piano. The professors put us together to play Bach flute and piano duet. We became quite close. So in the process of that, she would talk to me about her faith, her belief as a Baha'i. I wasn't particularly interested because I actually didn't really believe in God or think religion was very important, but she was a quite a striking, wonderful person, and she had friends from so many different backgrounds. I was quite attracted to her because of the diversity in her life. So it was her personality that attracted you to the Baha'i faith? I would say as an individual, she attracted me, and then she invited me to some meetings in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I went with her quite willingly. What I discovered in these meetings was people from all different walks of life who were gathered in the same room, and their thoughts were centered around the same idea of unity, but a unity in diversity. So there was a diversity of age, as well as race, as well as socioeconomic background. I found it highly stimulating after a relatively limited scope that I had been brought up with in New England. I was very curious. How do these people get like this? What is it that brings them together? Is there something special here that I didn't want to miss out on? So I thought maybe I better 
read up and start investigating it a little bit more seriously. And then how is it that you actually became an adherent of the Baha'i faith? I would say it really was through that personal investigation of the truth. It wasn't so simple because I don't think that my family and friends were very enthusiastic about all of this. They thought it was rather strange. Why should I want to branch out quite so much to something quite so different? But you have to remember this was the 1960s. A lot of people were asking a lot of questions and doing quite a lot of searching. My friend actually went away from Mills for a year or two, and I decided while she was gone that I wasn't really making it. This was going to be too difficult a change for me. So I sort of stopped going to the meetings and stopped reading the books. Then she came back, and she ended up in my room in my dormitory one day, and she said, oh, I think you should just come to one more meeting over in Berkeley. There's a good speaker, and I think you'd enjoy it. So I went. Gosh, when I got in that room, I just had the feeling that there was something going on in there that was spiritually very important, but not only spiritually, intellectually very logical and good and needed in the world. This idea of how to bring peoples together from all different backgrounds, that revelation was progressive, that the religions would not be set against each other, that there would be one truth just revealed over time as if they were chapters in a book. So all of this ended up appealing to me a great deal, and I finally decided that, gosh, if I was going to do something with my life that was going to be worthwhile and help in some small way to bring some peace to the world or a better understanding among its peoples, that this was probably it, and I'd better jump in there and give it a try. Was there some level of adjustment that you had to make growing up pretty much a religious and then jumping into a religion that where prayer is a central aspect of the Baha'i faith? Oh, that for sure. I mean, you know, I had, I had this little prayer book that they'd given me and I'd sort of read these prayers sort of the way I read a chapter out of a book. I would just try little by little to make an effort. I came across one reading in a very small book called The Hidden Words, and it said, Love me that I may love thee. If thou lovest me not, my love may in no wise reach thee. This definitely surprised me. I thought, my goodness, if I want to get to know this thing, I'm going to have to make a big effort and try and love God, think more about prayer and about these spiritual qualities, things like reverence. and I mean, I just never thought of all those things before. But I think the Baha'i community in the area really helped me a great deal. I mean, they knew that I was coming from a non-religious background, and they were very patient with me, and it was the spirit of the thing that carried me along motivated me to keep reading, and I started to say my prayers regularly. I even tried the Baha'i fast of 19 days that comes in March of every year, celebrated the holy days, and gradually it was just a transforming process, an educative process, and it wasn't all that difficult once I'd made up my mind to just give it a go and try. When you became a Baha'i, Did it sort of change the direction you were heading as you were in the cusp of adulthood? I'm not really sure where I was heading at that point, but I think the fact that I had become a Baha'i and was so really thrilled with this new life that had opened up for me with so much diversity that I pretty much decided that if possible, I would like to do what the Baha'is call go pioneering. And basically that means to go to another country, continue your profession or your life or whatever it was you were doing to the best of your ability, but live alongside of the Baha'is in another country and together work to develop the Baha'i activities in their country. This appealed to me a great deal. I thought it was an interesting idea. So I began to set my heart on that, sort of an international view of getting to know other types of peoples and cultures and how we all could relate to one another. 
and ultimately you did do that. But before you did, there's a number of songs that you have written that were inspired by you becoming a Baha'i, starting with the song Hollow Reed. I did. I started writing little songs. I found that lugging around a piano wasn't very possible, and a lot of the Baha'is weren't very interested in the classical music I was studying. So I got somebody to teach me how to play the guitar, and then I started writing these little songs according to different phrases from the Baha'i writings that would inspire me. And that particular one was about make me a hollow reed from which the pith of self hath been blown, that I may become a channel through which thy love may flow to others. This was a totally novel concept to me, that one might actually need to get rid of the pith of self in order to better serve humanity. So that one just made itself into a small song. Another song that you wrote about that time is called the Dawn Song. So tell me about that one. Well, I think it goes back to what you were talking about. How did I work my way into prayer? There were these beautiful prayers in the small prayer book I had. One was to be said at dawn as the sun comes up. Another was to be said at midnight. Others were for many different times that you might be feeling low or high or wanting to pray for others. There was such a wonderful choice of the prayers. And I would get up early in the morning, especially during the fasting period, and wish to start off my day with some prayer that it might sort of set me in a good framework. And I was pretty new at all this. So the words from that prayer also, some of them I found very inspiring. That's not a straight setting of a quotation, but some of the words in there do come from some one or two of the Baha'i prayers. So that sort of came along pretty early on when I had become a Baha'i. Rays of sun filter through the fog Workers on their docks Greet the mist of morn Praise be to thee, O my God for the splendors of thy light. Radiance hath been shed upon thy universe. My master breaks the dawn, the whole world is immersed. Praise to thee, O oh my God, for the day star of oneness is here. I rise from my couch and call thee from the 
chill of my floor. Send down on my servant what will protect her now at morn. Praise be to thee, O oh my God, Lord and King of all men. Praise be to thee, O oh my God, Lord and King of all men. Another song you wrote in this period was called The Garden Song. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So tell us about that one. The Baha'i Revelation is so vast. It seems that everywhere I was looking, I was finding something that was tick, 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 and it would get inside, and I'd start thinking about it. There was this fascinating quotation that I found that described how when some people go and they see a beautiful garden, they sort of stand outside and look in. And others wander into the garden and go around a little bit, and then they go out. And there are always some, it said, that actually stay and tend the garden for life. So for me, this was clearly an image of hearing about the Baha'i faith. And I did. I wandered around that garden for a long time, and I did. I went in, and then I came out again. But then finally, I got my courage and my intentions in line, and I did go in and decided to do my best to stay in that garden for, for my lifetime. So that's a very simple song. I think I did it sort of like a round or something. So there's a second voice that comes in and repeats it. It's really for children. I use it today for, for children's classes and children's songs. At the gate of the piece I wanted to showcase during this period in your life is Angels of Fire and Snow. So tell me about that. That's a powerful song. This quotation I found in a book called Prayers and Meditations, it just kind of knocked me off my feet because there was this image of an angel of fire and snow. And the theme was all about love and devotion and sacrifice. I had never thought about devotion and sacrifice very much before. So the image was very strong because it said that were it not for your tears, you would burn in the fire of your love. And were it not for that fire, you would drown in your tears. So this one just haunted me day and night. Such an exquisite image of this 
angels of fire and snow <laughs> until finally I got a hold of it and got a melody and began to get it down on paper. It's really a very moving little song that talks about a, a spirit in which one might wish to live one's life if one wishes to tend the garden. Angels, oh angels, angels of fire and snow. And you, you're picking me all these songs. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good thing, I hope. Yeah, I, I mean, it's very real because, yeah. you know, those songs are meaningful. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I remember these songs. So, uh, <laughs> you know, those songs have been around the world. And when people hear that, you mean Joni Lincoln wrote that song? I don't believe it. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's sort of funny. <laughs> yeah. So you finally fulfilled your goal by leaving the United States. So tell me the circumstances of you finally leaving the United States. I had a very close friend in New England who heard that Joni had gone to California and gotten mixed up with some strange religion. And when I came back after my studies to Boston area, I wasn't supposed to talk about the faith too much to my friends. My parents were not really very at ease with it. And out of respect for them, I sort of it pretty much to myself but this friend absolutely persisted and wanted to know what it was all about he had the feeling that I had changed and he wanted to know why we had been childhood friends I couldn't answer most of his questions they were too difficult they were all sort of intellectual and about the spiritual solution to the economic problem and how are we ever going to have one government and for the world and all. I couldn't handle it. So I gave him a bunch of books. He went off, went to a lot of Baha'i meetings and eventually became a Baha'i. And he is now my husband of close to 50 years. We had this very close childhood friendship and then it just blossomed and blossomed and grew. My parents had great respect for him. They'd known him and his family for a long time. And they were basically saying that if this young man, how can he become a Baha'i? Because he has his feet on the ground. He's smart. He's been at Harvard. 
they began to take a little bit more note of the importance of the faith. They had not wished for me to go pioneering because I said that was too dangerous for a young woman to go off like that. But when we were married, that became a possibility. And that was basically the wish that both of us had. He applied for jobs internationally after law school. He was admitted to a law firm in Paris, in France. And so that was really the beginning of all of our adventures overseas. It was in Paris that you wrote a song called Ami. Oh, yes, Ami. That's a nice song. (laughs) It was written by a lovely Parisian Baha'i who was a poet. She brought it to me and asked me, could I put it to music? And it lended itself beautifully to music. I've never actually found a good enough translation to sing that song in English, although many that I had in French did also go into English. But this one was, I don't know, particularly lyrical and nice with the French language. It's basically a song that's inviting all peoples to investigate this wonderful faith and to not let the chance pass by. Amen. Joni? We were in Paris for just under two years. We had always wished to make an even bigger leap and go into Africa. That had been our plan right after law school, but again, parents, grandparents, it sounded pretty wild. And now that I'm a parent and a grandparent myself, I can understand that better. (laughs) That it was quite a leap to take to go straight into the middle of Africa. We'd had two years to sort of get our feet under us, get really much more proficient in the French language. My husband to learn French law, which was absolutely necessary before going into French-speaking Africa. 
we just decided that now this was the time after about two years. We'd had one child in the United States and a second baby in Versailles, outside of Paris, in France. So there we were with our two little kitties and decided that we wanted to continue our lifelong adventure and go to the Central African Republic, right in the middle of the continent. Most people have never even heard of it. It is quite a backward country, and even today, tremendous struggles and internal difficulties. That's where we went and lived there for about 11 years, had a third child, and really raised our young children there. Well, one song that you wrote is called Hush Little Child. So tell me about that. By the time our third child was born, I was singing to the children every night. They had a choice of three songs, and they could choose whatever they liked. And I was always looking for lullabies. I wanted a lullaby somehow by a Baha'i. I had quite a few other lullabies that I'd learned as a child. And since I couldn't find any, it got written in my head. I began to sing that one. So that's called Hush, Little Child of the Kingdom. Hush, don't you cry. Hush, little child of the kingdom. Hush, my little Baha'i. You know, life was not very easy in the 1970s in Bangui, which is the capital city of the Central African Republic. This was a complicated country. The university had only opened one year before we came. The government was quite difficult. Those who are older will remember the name of Jean Bedel Bokassa, really basically a dictator. A lot of poverty, a lot of famine, huge difficulties with health, infrastructure extremely poor, 100 kilometers maybe of paved road when we first went. I mean, it was really stepping into quite a different time in the development of history. We did our best with our three kids, and they were there. They went to French schools, and they got a very good reading and writing and arithmetic-type French education. But I wanted for sure for them to have this the sweetness in their spirit, to send them to sleep every night with something meaningful and sweet that would not pay so much attention to the relative chaos that was often around us. The second song you'd written during that time is Suppliant Baji. Oh, yeah. Somehow I got a book of poems by a Canadian Baha'i called Roger White. 
I recommend these to everybody. They are just stunning little, very often short poems or short essays. He was living in the Holy Land at the Baha'i World Center, which we knew very little about, but he had descriptions in these poems of the different holy places. And he had this one called Suppliant Bashi. Now, Bashi is the name of the place where the founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah, is buried and where he lived the last few years of his life. But the words to this song I found extremely moving. He has such a minimalistic approach to describing this glorious place. I've now, of course, been there many, many times. But the way he described it, he was really describing really the spirit of the place and the concept of humility that he brings in at the end of the poem is quite profound. This, of course, is another of these qualities of humility and submission, compassion, detachment, many, many qualities that I was still, you know, (laughs) becoming acquainted with and trying very fast to learn under the circumstances of our life in the middle of the Central African Republic, as opposed to Paris and Boston and all our privileges of the past. So this aspect of having really a very humble approach to life and to one's own experiences was very helpful for me. If this is beginning to sound like I'm some mystic or something, it's it's really not true. I'm a regular, normal human being. <laughs> these are just different kinds of qualities I was trying to learn or things that appealed to me as they came along. And as I say, they worked their way into my subconscious and came out again as a song. Is this then all there is? A simple garden and a silence that displaces need for words. What portent in the blood-red wayside poppy? What message in the music of the birds? The hero's heart is hoisted on a cypress. The saints is softly folded as a rose. But mine lies shattered here among the pebbles On the only path the fainting coward knows On the only path 
the fainting coward know. So you were in the Central African Republic, you said, for about 10 years. So mm-hmm. what were the circumstances that had you move on from there? Actually, very difficult circumstances. My husband, who had this quite brilliant education (laughs) from the West, was very courageous and defended a number of different types of people and groups in court. He learned the local language fluently, which was called Sango. When we first moved there, there were only five lawyers in the country, and none of them were Africans because the Africans had to go to Paris to get their legal education, and they hadn't started coming back. Actually, they made an exception to the law, because you had to be either French or Central African in order to become a lawyer and practice in the courts. They made an exception for him. Perhaps he always thought it was because they wanted to begin to open the door for the young Africans that would be coming back from Paris very soon after that. But because of this rather courageous stance that he would take in the court to defend different people whom he felt were worthy of his defense, he got into some trouble because one of the people against whom he ended up speaking was appointed a minister. And as soon as he was appointed a minister of health, he got switched over to become a minister of justice. And the next thing we knew... It was being announced all over the public radio that my husband was disbarred. Now, these are the realities of life in such a country at that time. This was a long time ago now. But you could not count on things working the way you might have a concept of justice, of honesty, of trustworthiness, of Many, many of these things are different in different cultures. So we had three small children, and we really needed to find another solution. So he was eventually offered a job over in Cameroon. We took that job and went. And how long were you in Cameroon? We stayed for six years in Cameroon. In Cameroon in particular, one thing I remember was that The Baha'is themselves were so gifted at songwriting that I put quite a bit of time into encouraging them. You know, all this sort of transplant idea from the West and that, you know, you know how to do this and that and the other thing. That is not the point. When you go to another country, you're a guest in that country. And it's extremely important to learn their culture the best that you can and to appreciate their creative ability. So I started doing that in Central African Republic. And also, definitely, while we were in Cameroon, I used to sing with some of the young Cameroonian Baha'is a lot of their songs quite a bit. One song that you did write when you were in Cameroon was Chante, Chante. Can you tell us about that song? Yes. You know, when Baha'is go to other countries and try and be of service to those populations, there's an entire educational process that gets put into play. This means the education of children and young people, adolescents and youth. It's really more like sort of character training and transforming all of us all around the world from whatever culture we can so that we're better able to serve humanity and build stronger communities around the world. So I got quite involved with the education of children in that country thought we could use a few more songs. So there's one very sweet little song. It's just called Chante, Chante. It just talks about music and how lovely music is and how happy music makes one. It makes one want to dance. So it's just a little celebratory song. La musique est magique Elle nous rend heureux Elle nourrit la maker Elle nous rend joyeux Chantez, chantez de tout ton cœur. Chantez, chantez pour le bonheur. Chantez, chantez de tout ton cœur. Chantez, chantez pour le bonheur. La musique est magnifique, elle nous fait danser. On claque les doigts, on tape les pieds. Chantez, chantez, 
chanter, chanter pour le bonheur. That reminds me, isn't there a quote in the Baha'i writings about music being the ladder for the soul? That's exactly correct. And it does talk about music that way, as being a ladder by which the soul can ascend to realms on high. And there's also a qualifying statement that says, therefore, don't turn it into something that will excite the wings of self and passion. You know, the Baha'i writings have so much material in them, and it's been one of the great joys of my life to study in particular, these writings about music. I always used to wonder why it was that music moved me so and stimulated me so. And when I began studying these different quotations, I found the most astounding things about how even in any community, when people sing together, their hearts are just uplifted and it brings about wonderful results. Music also has the power to make one feel melancholy or to, if you wish, sort of more meditative. As a musician, this is very, very true. I mean, those of us who know music, we know all about the different keys and harmonies and chords and progressions and how tremendously powerful it is because it affects the soul, it affects the heart, it affects the emotions. I think that's why it's terribly important that in all of our efforts worldwide, We have a lot of music, and of course, this becomes very exciting when you travel because every country has sort of its own type of instruments and melodies and scales and rhythms. All of this is being used to develop the creative capacity that is just enormous that exists all over the world. So you said you were in Cameroon for about six years? Yes, that's right. Then after a little while, my husband was offered another job up in the Ivory Coast. That was about another 1,000 kilometers to the west. We thought that would be an interesting experience. Ivory Coast was quite a sophisticated country at that time. We had basically gone from very unsophisticated circumstances to a relatively prosperous country of Cameroon where there was mostly peace onto the Ivory Coast. It seems every country we went to actually had an overthrow of the government. I began to wonder, you know, what kind of an influence we were having. But anyway, we lived our way through two or three revolutions during all these different periods. And we did end up in the Ivory Coast where things were really quite sophisticated, quite a a huge number of expatriates were there. The Baha'i community was quite strong and moving ahead nicely. In each of these countries, we were able to do different kinds of activities because the needs were different. While you were there, you wrote a song called Duarte Vieira. Duarte Vieira. So tell us about that one. That is another one of Roger White's poems. It's about Duarte Vieira. He was a gentleman who was in... Portugal for a while, but he actually came from Guinea, the Portuguese-speaking Guinea, and he was one of the very early Baha'is in his country. He began teaching his faith quite fervently, and he was imprisoned because of that. He was eventually killed in prison, or he died in prison because of ill treatment. So even though it sounds a little gruesome and not too nice, the poem is so beautifully written by Roger. He says, tell Duarte Vieira, kindly tell, what crime won you a prison cell? So it goes on like that. Again, it just moved me so much. I thought this one has got to be a song. There is so much history in every one of these countries about how The first of the populations became Baha'is and what they went through and what it was like those early 10, 20, 30 years. And a lot of it is really very inspiring. I just wish to set that one to music. What crime won you a prison 
himself your testament a biscuit tin what dwarf of your was your sin what was the error of your ways that heaven's concourse sings your praise what offense did you commit tell that we may follow Our skulking fears by you allayed, we seek a crime so richly paid. All Africa now vastly blessed, Baha's felon laid to rest. Tell the art of Yera kindly tell what crime won you a prison cell another song you wrote in the Ivory Coast is called Avec Lunuit with unity in English, I suppose. Yes, yes, yes. That's <laughs> Avec l'unité. That's a fun, fun song that has really good rhythm. It was great for group singing. Actually, the background of that song is kind of funny. You know, it's not atypical that you have your bumps in the road and mistakes get made. Consulting together and working things out with such a diverse population is not always easy. You have to remember that in these countries... The people who became Baha'is were often from many different tribal groups. These tribal groups, well, we know something about prejudice and ethnicity here in the United States, but it's just the same, you know. They had different languages, they had different food, they had different customs, they had different musical instruments and rhythms. To bring them all together to work as one under the sheltering branch of the Baha'i faith was quite wonderful but also not easy. So one weekend, things were sort of going a little scratchily in one of the meetings I was in, and I thought, hmm, got to have a song now, got to pull us out of this. So I came up with this little song on the spot. It's called Avec l'unité. It says basically, with unity, everything is possible. Without unity, nothing works well. And it goes on to talk about how exciting it is to actually spread your wings and be a Baha'i and fly and try something new that's really going to bring all the peoples together and to share this important message with other people. Avec l'unité, tout est possible sans unité. Rien ne marche bien. Avec l'unité, le monde progressera. Sans unité, il n'avance pas. Levons-nous, enflammons-nous, déployons nos ailes. Baha'u'llah est venu, qu'attendons-nous, partageons les bonnes nouvelles. Avec l'unité, tout est possible sans unité. Rien ne marche bien. Avec l'unité, le monde progressera. Since we're talking a little bit about my rather unusual musical career, (laughs) where I had such an excellent education in university, and then we traveled so much, it it just took a different shape, you know? I I couldn't do the normal things that you might have done, you know? The first country I told you about that we moved to, there were only five pianos in the country, and they were all out of tune. 
I learned how to play a lot of Joplin. I mean, I just sort of had to adjust according to wherever we were. The diversity of the experience that I had as we kept going ahead on all our adventures, I'm just extremely thankful for all of that. So what were the reasons for leaving the Ivory Coast? That was, again, quite a dramatic switch. We used to get faxes in those days, and my husband got a fax down at his office and told me I should come down to his office in the downtown Abidjan, the capital of the Ivory Coast. And it was actually a message for me from the Baha'i World Center saying that I had been appointed to an international institution in Israel, in Haifa, and would I please be able to come right away for a term of five years? That was a great honor, really, to be invited to the Holy Land. My husband, just a few days later, received a very similar message asking him if he would please come because he had been appointed as what is termed the Secretary General of the Baha'i International Community. So the two of us prepared to basically wind up our life in Africa and go to a completely different type of an experience where we would be serving at the Baha'i World Center with about 500 people who'd come from all over the world to give various periods of times and to assist with various aspects of the work. These songs I can see now, at least the ones that we're talking about, many of them have the theme of transformation in them. And, you know, Baha'is believe very deeply that man is a noble creature, that he has tremendous potential, that maybe his education has not been what it should. But with education and spiritual transformation, man will gradually become quite transformed. So I think these kinds of themes must have had quite an appeal for me. Well, Joni, I want to thank you so much for sharing your life and your work with us. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Joan Lincoln, a world traveler for the Baha'i faith and an accomplished musician. You can find this interview and other interviews at abahaiperspective.com. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes by searching for A Baha'i Perspective. For information specifically on the Baha'i faith, you can go to the website baha'i.org or you can call the toll-free number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you'll join me next time on A Baha'i Perspective. This is WXOJLP Northampton, 103.3 FM, your Valley Free Radio Station, streaming at www.valleyfreeradio.org.